Hello, I'm back, and welcome to an actual episode 1 this time. We continue the journey and we have some serious business to do. Remember this cube? Hidden between the lies and deception of beautiful colors and movement, we have this. The problem is that it's not how cubes look in real life, and today we make it better. Things look realistic because they respond to light. After all, vision is possible due to light being perceived by your eyes. And it's similar in this scenario. Sort of. To put it in game engine terms, we need a light source, the cube needs a material, and based on that, we can try to simulate how it would look in real life. Before performing any calculations, let's look into how we are using the DirectX 11 pipeline to display the cube currently. Currently it has 8 vertices, which represent the 8 corners. We set the position and color for each corner. The UV coordinates can be ignored for now as they are not relevant. These values make more sense if we visualize the cube in a 3D coordinate system. Since we only have 8 vertices defined, and the walls of the cube are made of triangles, it means that some of the triangles share common vertices. We can render such geometry using index buffers. Index buffers are easier to understand while analyzing as square. Let's say we have a square with vertices called 0, 1, 2, and 3. If the GPU has already stored the memory about the vertices, including the positions and colors, we can tell it to draw a square just by telling it the order of the vertices. For example, if we store the vertex information of this square in the GPU and set the index array to 1, 2, 3, 1, 0, 2, it would draw triangles like this. This technique is called indexing. The next aspect we need to understand before diving into the shader programs themselves is how vertices are stored in GPU memory, and this concept is actually pretty straightforward. We first need to define a structure that will correspond to each data point stored in the GPU. In our current scenario, it is a struct called vertex position color uv. And as we can see, our vertex array is filled with these objects. The memory structure that contains the information of the vertices in the graphics card is called a vertex buffer. And before creating it, we need to specify how many bytes it will occupy. This is done by setting the byte width property of the buffer description to be the raw byte size of the vertex position color UV, multiplied by the total count of the vertices. So, if we have 8 vertices, of which each are 32 bytes, the total count of bytes allocated in the GPU will be 8 times 32. This is quite similar to how we calculate an area of a rectangle by multiplying its width and its length. A very similar method is used for the index buffer, which is also stored directly in the GPU memory. The main difference is that the index is just a single number and requires considerably less space than the information of an entire vertex, making indexing memory efficient in comparison. Now, we can finally take a look into our vertex and pixel shaders. DirectX 11 uses shaders written in high-level shading language, otherwise known as HLSL. So the syntax will be different from the C++ code we looked at before. Let's first inspect the vertex shader. The shader contains structure definitions for the input and the output of the shader. And as you can see, the input corresponds directly to the vertex position color UV structure in C++. The output contains the same information, because we also need to pass it to the pixel shader later in the pipeline. We can ignore the C buffer variables for now, as these are related to the camera and object positions in the world, and are not relevant for colors in this scenario. The actual program part of the shader is called main. It takes input object as an input and returns the output object. Besides modifying the position variable based on the camera's orientation and object's world's position, it just passes the variables further into the pipeline so the pixel shader can access it. Moving on to the pixel shader, it takes the exact same data that the vertex shader program returned as output. The most interesting part about the pixel shader is that the return value of the main program 
is actually the color of the pixel, so we can directly hard code the color as a return value to change the color of the cube. In theory, it is as simple as returning a value for each pixel, but in practice, if we want a realistic result, we need to perform light and material calculations to decide what color the pixel should be, because it's not possible to just hard code a value for each pixel. So, in order to make our cube more realistic, we need to incorporate a lighting model. But I am no light specialist, so it is time to visit the internet and perform some research. <clears throat> anyway, for the light reflection model, we are going to use the Fong model, which was created by a student of University of Utah. Bùi Tường Phong. The Fong reflection model is a popular solution for simulating material and light interaction, and it consists of three types of illumination. The first type is ambient illumination, and it represents global or indirect lighting in the scene. Ambient light tries to simulate light that is indirectly affecting the material such as bounced or scattered light from the scene. It prevents things from being completely dark if they do not get direct light. The second type is diffuse illumination. Diffuse illumination simulates light that is scattered along the surface in all directions when it hits the material. The result very much depends on which direction the surface is facing, as if the surface is not directly facing or facing the light source at an angle, the diffuse illumination effect will be minimal. The third type of illumination is called specular illumination, and it represents concentrated reflections, which can be called specks of concentrated light. This results in small, much brighter spots as if they were completely reflecting the light. Just like diffuse illumination, specular illumination is also dependent on the angle between the direction of the surface and the camera, and the result also varies based on the direction it is observed from. In addition to the three light parameters, the material itself is also responsible for the final result. It has its own ambient, diffuse and specular properties that affect its interaction with light. And it also has a parameter called shininess that determines the size and concentration of specular lighting and can be used to simulate very glossy surfaces like metal or polish. To combine the three illumination results, the Fong reflection model uses a shading equation that takes into account the properties of the lights and the material as well as the angles between the light source, viewer, and the surface normals, which we will discuss shortly. The final color provides somewhat realistic representation of how light interacts with the material surface. Having stole, I mean, acquired the calculations, we only need to pass the necessary variables needed to calculate the output of the pixel shader, and you might have noticed that we are missing one variable by the name of normal, and the camera's position is also unknown to the pixel shader. Let's talk about normals first. In computer graphics, a normal is a normalized vector that indicates the direction the surface of a polygon is facing. A 3D vector is used because the direction needs to be determined in 3D space. We can go a bit further into what normalized means, because this concept is important not only in graphics, but in computer science in general. A vector's length usually represents its magnitude, but since we only need the vector to represent a direction of the surface, the magnitude is not relevant. Normalizing a vector means that the length of the vector is adjusted to be precisely 1, while preserving the direction of the original vector. In the context of the actual pixel shader, or for this matter most light calculations, we need to know the direction the geometry is facing, as the fusion and specular illumination calculations are dependent on it. To pass the normal to the shader, we just need to follow the same procedure as with colors. We need to turn the vertex position color UV structure into vertex position normal color UV and edit all the related code, including specifying the normals for each of the cube's vertices. We essentially just need to add one more additional variable to the vertex information. And here we run into a problem. If you think about it, each vertex of the cube is currently shared between three walls of the cube, but we also need to specify which direction each wall is facing by setting the normals. Since normals are set per vertex, it is impossible to achieve this with just 8 vertices, and the only way to resolve this is to add 3 times more vertices in each corner, 
so each wall can have its own corner vertex with unique normal information. This leaves us with a total of 24 vertices for the cube. Just as an example, this is what the cube would look like with incorrect normal data using the Fong reflection model. After setting the normal data for all 24 vertices and changing the index array, we just need to pass the camera's position to the shader as mentioned. And this is done by passing it to the GPU memory using constant buffers that we have not yet talked about. But let's leave the explanation for another time, because for now, all that matters is that Fong reflection model knows the camera's position. And there you have it! We have transformed the boring cube into a not so boring one. And the result is now comparable to other game engines, at least a little. This episode was more of a technical one, since the topic is a bit complicated. We haven't fully covered everything, but I think the main idea of how the cube is created and rendered should be more clear now. Material and light setup was actually leading to something, and next time we are going to put our current engine to the test, and try to create a simulation of sorts that you've definitely seen before if you ever used Windows XP, though I won't spoil exactly what it is. For those of you who actually watched till the end, a huge thank you, and if you want to support me and the channel, a like or sub would be very appreciated. Hopefully you learned something new. See ya!